Welcome everyone to this session, Media in a Changing World. It is my true pleasure actually to welcome our two speakers today. So we are going to begin with Sharon J. Riley. Sharon is an award-winning journalist based in Edmonton. She is the Prairie's Bureau Chief for the Narwhal, an online magazine focusing on issues related to the environment and energy. And the Narwhal is a leader in nonprofit journalism in Canada. Sharon's writing has been published in The Walrus, Harper's, The Taiyi, and Maisonneuve, among others. Her work for the Narwhal has been nominated for a Canadian Association of Journalists Award and a Digital Publishing Award. She was also named a finalist in the 2017 National Magazine Awards Best New Magazine Writer category was a 2017 recipient of the Access Copyright Foundation's Marion Hebb Research Grant for Literary Arts and won the Allen Slate Prize for Journalism in 2020. Congratulations. <laughs> Sharon was born and raised in rural Alberta, and if she's not at her computer, she's probably in the Rockies with her family. The title of Sharon's talk today is The Role of Journalism in Democracy in an Online World. Our second speaker is Jeremy Appel. Jeremy moved to Alberta in 2017 from the Toronto area in pursuit of journalism work. He gained notoriety as a reporter and columnist at the Medicine Hat News due to his unsparing criticisms of Jason Kenney and the UCP. A COVID layoff led him to become a freelancer before moving to Calgary to serve as a City Hall reporter for the sprawl, covering the lead up to the 2021 civic election. After getting laid off from the sprawl, Appel returned to freelancing and started the Orchard newsletter on Substack, which I would recommend, which provides news and analysis from an unapologetically progressive angle with particular attention to the intersection of politics, media, and corporate power. Jeremy's work has appeared in various mainstream and independent outlets, including CBC News, the Canadian Jewish News, Jacobin, Press Progress, The Progress Report, The Maple, Ricochet, The Breach, and The Taiyi. Jeremy's talk today is Promises and Perils of Independent Media. So please welcome them. Thank you. I wanted to start out by giving you a quick rundown of what the Narwhal is. We're an online magazine focused on stories related to energy and the environment. Uh, when we launched, our founder saw us sort of as the equivalent to the environment section in the newspaper, which didn't exist at the time. Uh, it was similar to, say, like a business or sports section, but at the time there were very, very few dedicated environment reporters in Canada, and that was the gap that we were seeking to fill. We launched in May 2018, and I joined later that summer as the Alberta investigative reporter. Um, and as was mentioned, I'm now the Prairie's Bureau Chief. So another distinctive feature of the Narwhal is that uh, we're not-for-profit. So we don't sell ads, so we don't have a paywall, uh, but we do issue tax receipts. So this is our team. On the left there is our Prairies team, which now includes three of us. Uh, my colleagues Drew Anderson, he covers uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan for the Narwhal, and Julia simone Wetkers covers Manitoba from Winnipeg. Uh, and on the right is our whole team, which has grown so much in the past five years. I was the second ever uh, staff member of the Narwhal, and now we're approaching 25. So it's a really great place to work. So proud to be part of the Narwhal. Uh, but it's not just about fun. Uh, we also work really hard to tell stories that aren't found elsewhere. So we write a mix of on-the-ground features, investigations, explainers, news, and analysis. We have, I think, a ton to celebrate at the Narwhal. We really feel like a bright spot in Canadian media. But at the same time, we recognize that Canadian media is at a crossroads. So while we're pushing to reach new audiences and tell important stories, there are definitely headwinds. Uh, polarization is a growing concern, like I've written up there, and trust in media is definitely declining. I don't think I need to tell you all of this, but I, I'm going to anyways. It's not a pretty picture, but we're increasingly seeing that trust in media is declining. This is from this year's Reuters Institute Digital News Report. You can see that less than half of Canadians report trusting news most of the time. And that, that's a downward trend. I think this, personally, I think this has a lot to do with the decline of local news. Uh, hardly anyone in regular life interacts with a journalist or a community reporter anymore. And I can feel this anecdotally. When I meet people and I say I'm a journalist, it's often a bit like they're encountering an exotic animal. Like, <laughs> wow, I've never met one of you before. <laughs> are you fake? <laughs> so that's one part of the problem. We're also seeing that people are tired of the news. 
Uh, people are actively seeking to avoid the news. 71% uh, of people here say they try to avoid the news at least sometimes. That's also on the rise. And at the same time, like I said, uh, polarization is a growing concern, including in Canada. And with polarization in society comes polarization in media diets and information diets. This here is from a report called Far and Widening, the, the Rise of Polarization in Canada. It was published this summer. Uh, it's a survey of young adults, and I don't know if you can read those numbers up there, but 68% of young adults surveyed identified polarization as a top concern about the future. This obviously has impacts on our work as journalists. Many people aren't willing to pay for journalism. It's over 80% say they're not paying for any subscriptions from Canadian news sites. There's a bit of a bright spot. It seems like that might be increasing a tiny bit, but it's still it's not a lot of people who are willing to pay. All that to say, I think it's kind of clear that the old way of doing journalism isn't working for a lot of people anymore. We could go on all day about what the old way is, but I think we can summarize by saying the old way of journalism involved a homogenous pool of journalists, a lack of diversity, and a de dependence on ad revenue, which too often meant prioritizing trying to sell papers. Over-reliance on a single mode of revenue it obviously exposed journalism institutions to a lot of risk. And then the internet happened. As I understand it, digital ads pay basically nothing compared to traditional print ads, and never mind that most of that ad revenue goes to social media companies. That business model is crumbling, and I think we see that. It's a quote here from the Center for Media Technology and Democracy. It's saying, journalism is in peril. We're talking about layoffs, cutbacks, lack of diversity, disappearance of local news, technological disruption, reliance on freelancers. Those are all things we talk about every day in journalism right now. It's quite clear that media organizations are broadly struggling financially. That means fewer staff journalists. I'm proud to say that the Narwhal spends 70% of our budget directly on staff journalists. It's just another shameless plug for how proud I am to work at the Narwhal. But it's clear that hiring new staff journalists is just not a reality for a lot of major media organizations right now. At the same time, uh, this changing media landscape means fewer newspapers. I think we're all familiar with the closure of local papers. Jeremy and I just were chatting about this. Well, I'm from a farm in rural Alberta, but the nearest town had a community newspaper that closed not that long ago, and it just happens everywhere. And then at the same time, it does not mean that we have fewer PR people. This is a handy graph from the TIE. So we're now in a world with less journalists, less newspapers, and more people working around the clock to push out the message for their business or government or institution. To me, that's a bit drier. And at the same time as all of this, we also have to talk about changing algorithms and news bands. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the idea that you can no longer see news on um, Facebook and Instagram or Meta's companies. Uh, these are some comments from Meta that when it announced it was banning all news content this summer in Canada it was in response to Bill C-18, Canada's Online News Act. That means that a lot of the way that media outlets have come to rely on reaching audiences doesn't work anymore. And I think we all know what happens in a news vacuum, especially on social media. It's uh, misinformation and disinformation step in to fill the gaps. That's the industry. But I do really believe that journalism is really important. I hope you all agree on this. I'm just going to preach about it a little bit here. I, journalism helps inform citizens. It sheds light in dark corners of society. Journalism holds power accountable. And there has to be an honest check on power. I think journalism has undergone a bit of a reckoning in recent years, uh, realizing that the classic principle of objectivity can be something of a myth. But journalists still have the ability and the responsibility to speak out, seek out multiple perspectives. And in an increasingly polarized world, I think that's crucial. We try to be fair as journalists in reaching all sides and allowing people to speak for themselves. We try to put debates in front of the public so people can make up their own minds about things. One of the best parts about my job, I think, is that we get paid to spend, month, spend time going down rabbit holes, um, filing freedom of information requests, we get paid to try really hard to do things right and to not just you know, tweet hot takes. We try to fact check and get context. It's clear that if we want to try to save journalism, though, we need to do something new. This spring at the Narwhal, we had our first ever in-person gathering. I got to meet all of those colleagues that, we, that I now have. And, and someone said something that was really simple but really profound to me. You know, If we want to reach new audiences, we need to do new things. And it's something we've been unwilling to do as journalists for a long time. 
Uh, we're really striving for that at the Narwhal. And there's an American journalist named Amanda Ripley who's really sort of encapsulated a lot of the principles that we're trying to follow at the Narwhal. She's been really influ influential in our thinking at, on this, and she says, we need to find ways to help our audiences leave their foxholes and consider new ideas. So that's what we're trying to do. What's the solution? This is our mission and purpose at the Narwhal. As you can see, we're a little bit obsessed with the idea of trying to bridge divides. There's a lot to go that is there that is something that we go for every single day. We're really trying to work on it. I think one of the things that's really key for journalism is having journalists who understand the communities that they're reporting on. I'm not saying that every journalist needs to be from the community that they're working in, but I do think having a diverse team of journalists, and we talk about diversity there, helps more people to see their communities reflected in media. And a diverse team can also put their heads together to have a much better understanding of issues, history, emotions, relationships at play when it comes to a story. Also there we talk about uh, reaching outside the choir People can be pretty skeptical of a reporter, especially as an environment reporter in Alberta. I, I can't tell you how many times I've been asked, you know, like, so you're an environmentalist? I'm like, no, I'm, I'm here as a journalist. I recover the environment much in the same way that a reporter might cover City Hall, but they're not the mayor, you know. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't always resonate that way, and people really are skeptical. Our goal is to bring fair, context-rich, and nuanced journalism to people, including to local communities, and we hope that we can gain their respect. Next question is, that's great, but how? There are a couple of things that we keep into, take into account a lot when we're trying to think about the how. One is solution stories. Solutions journalism kind of sounds a bit like a, you know, publishing puff pieces that celebrate cool things. Uh, that's not what it is. It's not PR for, you know, an idea to clean up the tailings ponds. You'd be surprised how many pitches we get from companies claim they've, they've solved it all and that we should cover it. <laughs> the idea is to rigorously investigate a plan and its results. So I just want to share some of our work with you and tell us, tell you some of our thinking. This story, it, like even in the headline there, uh, doesn't sound like a solution story, but I would argue that it is. It's written by my colleague Drew, based in Calgary, and it's about a community in Drumheller that floods regularly and, and increasingly frequently with climate change. Projections indicate it'll flood more and more frequently as time goes on. So the solution the town came up with was to buy out all the residents and force them out. Uh, it's part of the concept of what's called managed retreat, some of you might be familiar with. So this story is not about how great this solution is. It's not about how great it is that Drumheller is forcing these people out of their homes. Uh, it's about the complexity and the emotions and the reality of the problem and the challenges of the solution that has been put forward to, fi to fix it. A lot of the people that Drew spoke to told him they didn't agree with everything he wrote. And a lot of them don't think that climate change is going to change their home at all. But they felt like they were fairly represented, and they saw themselves as part of that complexity, and they were happy with it. So that was a big win for us. The next here is uh, written by my colleague Fatima Syed. Uh, it really gets into the hurdles faced by a First Nation working towards energy sovereignty. So the headline does look a little bit more like a solution there. Um, the idea was that that First Nation was working to get off of diesel generators, and that was a really long road for them. It wasn't an easy process. So this is about how solutions can be really slow and murky and tricky. Um, but this story adds context, it explains the challenges, and really dives into the history. You've probably heard me say complexity about 75 times already. It's something we talk a lot about at the Narwhal. <laughs> Uh, and that goes back to this idea of um, Amanda Ripley and the journalist based in the States. So she wrote a p big piece for the Washington Post right around when the Narwhal was founded called Complicating the Narratives. The lesson for journalists or anyone working amidst intractable conflict, complicate the narrative. First, complexity leads to a fuller, more accurate story. Secondly, it boosts the odds that your work will matter, particularly, particularly if it is about a polarizing issue. When people encounter complexity, they become more curious and less closed off to new information. They listen, in other words. That's our goal. She also talked about how journalism has always thought of you know, ourselves as journalists as objective seekers of truth, and we've just doubled down in recent years, continuing to do more of the same kind of journalism despite mounting evidence that our work is not having the impact that it once did. 
we continue to collect facts and capture quotes as if we're operating in a linear world, and we're not. So the idea here is to revive complexity in a time of what often seems like false simplicity. Typically, historically, re reporters have done the opposite. We cut the quotes that don't fit the narrative of the story that we're writing, or our editor cuts them for us. We look for coherence and tidiness, a, an easy story for an audience to digest. And tidy narratives succumb to the urge to simplify, which I think warps reality until one side looks good and the other side looks evil. What do we do at the Narwhal? Well, we try to ask questions that get at people's motivations. We try to be really curious. We try to get people to stop demonizing each other. One of the most powerful ideas to, and the way to get people to stop demonizing each other is to actually introduce them to one another. I think journalists have a role to play in that in exposing communities of different viewpoints to each other. You know, once people have met and sort of understood or empathized with other people, either in person or through writing or any form of journalism, they have a harder time caricaturing one another. I'm going to point some, out some examples of our reporting that I think does this pretty well. This is a story about Kitimat in BC. It's home to a, an LNG Canada gas liquefaction and export facility. It was written by my colleague Matt Simmons, who lives in Smithers, BC. He went to Kitimat. Um, he didn't report this story from his desk, which also is a, a, a big <laughs> win, I think, these days for journalism, and he really worked to feature a lot of voices of, of many different town residents into this piece. So he spoke to the pro-industry mayor, he spoke to business owners, he spoke to elders, he spoke to environmentalists. He let them say their piece, and he humanizes the conflict around LNG and what it means for the town, and really amplified the complexity in that story. Couldn't do a presentation with at least one plug for my own journalism, so this is a piece I wrote quite a few years ago now, but I was setting out to speak to coal miners, and I thought, I'll go speak to some coal miners who are going to lose their jobs, and they're all probably going to go work in solar or something, so I'll write about them. The local union of coal workers invited me to spend the day with them at the Union Hall in Wabaman. When I went here, this was fresh on the heels of when I had first encountered Amanda Ripley's work about complicating the narratives. I really went into it just so enthusiastic, searching for not the positions people heard on the news. You know, I didn't want to hear why they thought coal was clean or whatever. I wanted to hear like how they came to those ideas, what the transition away from coal to natural gas meant to them emotionally and what their hopes and fears were. And I was so surprised by what I found. I remember standing outside the Union Hall messaging my editors, and I looked this up last night to see what I actually said. I said, guys, there's a vegan coal miner here that's been feeding me vegan goodies all day, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. The point was to show that we might have a caricature of people who work in coal and who wanted coal to continue, but it was more complicated than that. And ultimately, it's a labor issue as well as an environmental issue. There were coal miners there who denied climate change, for sure. There were also coal miners worried about the impacts of burning coal on people's health. And there was the vegan coal miner. There was a gun-obsessed coal miner who teared up talking about how he didn't want to lose his job and not be able to work in a community where he could tuck his kids into bed every night anymore. That was, for me, like my first example of really trying to complicate the narrative. And I'll just show one more example here. This is written by my colleague Sarah Cox about the Apache Dot Nation's position on logging in Ferry Creek. She wrote this at a time when Ferry Creek was really hitting the news cycle. Uh, it was a peak time for clashes between people opposed to logging and the RCMP. Um, and this was a complicated story. Sarah worked for months to get um, people in Apache Dot Nation to speak to her about this because they were worried about how they'd be portrayed. This piece looks at the complicated positions of people who live there. It doesn't shy away from acknowledging that even within the nation there were divergent opinions, but that it didn't fit tidily with a lot of the environmental messaging around stopping logging in Ferry Creek. The last thing I'll show you here is this is a little checklist that we look at when we're assigning or writing or editing stories we we're trying to do with our journalism. We're trying to illuminate new, diverse, underrepresented perspectives. That can mean any variety of things. Uh, we're trying to bring policy decisions to life through lived experience of people uh, in community. We're trying to amplify the voices of what we're calling here marginalized and ordinary people. Um, I think too often a lot of debate ends up between policy wonks and experts and PR people, and I think it's really interesting to hear people who are having, they're, they're living it, uh, they're near it. Um, we also try to find empathy and understanding for opposing views without compromising on our own values. This is something that comes up a lot, say, with the 
denying climate change? How do you acknowledge that someone has an extremely different view that is completely factually inaccurate without offending <laughs> them? Uh, it's complicated, uh, but we go for it. We try. We try to deal in the complexity of issues, make them accessible, uh, bring some hope, and uh, we really strive to invest a lot in photography so that we can tell ugly stories beautifully. I've just been working this past week. It's a f uh, photo essay about the oil sands. Uh, we sent photographer Amber Bracken on a helicopter flight over the oil sands, and like just like it's the m best example of her in a long time of telling a really ugly story beautifully. So check it out on Monday morning. <laughs> and yeah, you can see there we try to not just repeat the same old perspectives and voices. Um, try not, well, obviously don't want to support or promote stereotypes or incite violence, and we don't want to inflame an issue in a way that detracts from the larger divide we're trying to bridge. I'll leave it there, and we'll save questions for after Jeremy's done speaking. Thank you very much. To start, it's really an honor to uh, speak alongside Sharon, uh, whose uh, news outlet, The Narwhal, has, uh, for my money, been one of the uh, exemplary uh, independent media outlets that we're talking about uh, this afternoon. I mean, you just look at the reporting on the Green Belt, for example. I mean, that's such, I think, a powerful example of how journalism, like investigative journalism, can uh, affect change. It's probably not secret to uh, anyone here that Canadian uh, mainstream media is uh, not in a good way. When people talk about the media, I think there's some certain assumptions uh, that go with that, that um, or even the mainstream media that aren't uh, necessarily the case, right? There is a lot of great work that gets done in mainstream media outlets, and I think we should applaud that when it happens without losing sight of sort of the, uh, I think, patterns you can discern from reading, like, any Canadian newspaper or watching any news broadcast. What I'm trying to emphasize is that the media is contested territory, right? It, it sort of doesn't have to be um, the way it is. It doesn't always have to be bad either when we're talking about mainstream news. I've worked in both uh, mainstream and independent media. Uh, by this point in my career, I've definitely uh, done more work for independent. I guess just to start by sort of telling you about myself and my, my, my sort of journey uh, to uh, independent media, I uh, studied journalism at Humber College in Toronto, uh, print journalism, which uh, you know was uh, certainly a, a choice uh, in uh, 2015. I interned at uh, the Toronto Sun, actually, um, which I think a lot of people find funny, in, including myself. And uh, also uh, the agenda with Steve Pakin on TVO. I know a lot of the uh, journalists who recently took buyouts rather than return to a hostile workplace after uh, they were on strike for a long time. As I just alluded to, my sort of entrance into journalism uh, coincided with this uh, increasing concentration of Canadian print media. When I was at The Sun in the summer of 2015, Post Media just bought all the Sun papers and promised that, uh, you know, the Sun papers and sort of their um, uh, broadsheet counterparts, like the Edmonton Journal, for example, and the Edmonton Sun, would remain editorially uh, distinct, right? And that was a lie. The stories you read in, you know, the Edmonton Journal and Edmonton Sun, or Ottawa Citizen and Ottawa Sun, are literally the exact same. Uh, the difference is uh, how the newspapers look physically and uh, a different sort of cast of right-wing columnists. I assumed that uh, I would find a journalism job somewhere um, close to where I grew up, Toronto, and uh, it's quite uh, naive of me. Uh, after a few months of just sending out applications, focusing on, like, Toronto and like southwestern Ontario, the 
job was elusive. So I started sending out job applications like all over Canada, just wherever I could get a job, get a start, and then eventually make my way back home. I actually, I got offered a job at the White Court Star, um, sort of the, the post-media rag uh, in, in, in a town, a small town, like 9,000 people, a, couple hour, a bit less than a couple hours uh, northwest of here. I had originally applied to uh, the Cameras Canadian, which is uh, Sharon's uh, hometown paper, she alluded to in uh, her talk. Um, but I got a call from uh, sort of a post-media, the po post-media VP who was like doing the hiring, uh, Lauren Motley, who's actually now the editor-in-chief of both the Calgary uh, Herald slash Sun and Edmonton Journal slash Sun, um, who said that they hired someone with like a decade of uh, managerial experience in uh, news in that that uh, opening had been closed, but you could offer me a job in White Court. And my response was, White Horse? Like, cool. <laughs> and I was just like, no, no, White Court. And I had to look it up. I worked there for about six months. Uh, it was pretty uh, isolating uh, experience, I would say, especially coming from like the suburbs of Toronto and in, in, in moving to like a really small town. Uh, when I moved into my apartment, uh, one of the first things I noticed was that uh, uh, someone like across the street from my building uh, had a Confederate flag in their window. And I thought that was weird because we we're not in the South. <laughs> well, this was before the UCP. This was while Kenny was doing his, uh, you know, unity tour. And so I realized I need to get out of there. Uh, luckily for me, um, there was an opening at the Medicine Hat News, a daily newspaper in the southeastern corner of Alberta. It was here that I sort of, I think, came into my own as a journalist and, and sort of developed my own voice. Uh, I did a lot of reporting and uh, wrote some uh, opinion commentary. I was sort of in a lucky position because Medicine Hat is like a small enough market where I could get away with writing things that you wouldn't see with regularity in uh, the post-media owned papers or on the TV networks. But it was big enough, right? I mean, it's one of the seven sort of cities in Alberta that people started paying attention when they were seeing sort of the, these columns from myself as well as my former colleague. Well, I guess current colleague because we host a podcast together, uh, Scott Schmidt. People started paying attention at the same time when I, I, I sort of ostensibly had all this editorial freedom I wouldn't have had elsewhere. It, it, it also became increasingly apparent to me the untenable pressure that's put on journalists in mainstream newsrooms where they're expected to increasingly do more with less resources. Because of that, uh, it, it kind of came as a relief to me almost when I was laid off in April of 2020, in the early days of the pandemic. I, I was kind of done with it, but I stuck around Medicine Hat because it was a temporary layoff. So I didn't know when um, or if I, I, I would be asked back. And, I started freelancing um, mostly for, uh, you know, independent progressive media outlets, which I will get to shortly. Also did some stuff for the CBC, Canadian Jewish News, etc. Soon after I was laid off, Duncan Kinney, actually, the editor of the Progress Report, which uh, I now uh, work at part time as a staff reporter, uh, he uh, messaged me soon after I was laid off, and, and, and he was just like, let's do some journalism. That was really my first foray into sort of the investigative reporting I had always wanted to do, but at the Medicine Hat News newsroom, I, I just didn't have the resources to do it because it was just constantly cover this, cover that, like really... Um, uh, banal things um, that I, you know, I had like four beats at the Medicine Hat News because, I, I mean, I had two beats, which was crime and police, and then education, um, both post-secondary and um, 
uh, uh, K to 12, and th right, those were two beats that I had to do, but really there were four, right? Because those would have been each uh, two separate beats. I did some work I, I was immensely proud of still, and I think has aged very well um, in those early days of my layoff with the progress report. You know, looking into sort of shady, small oil and gas companies uh, like Manitowoc Energy, uh, whose owner declared bankruptcy, uh, dumped his abandoned wells on the uh, increasingly publicly funded Orphan Well Association, and then just create a new company which purchased the wells that could still pump oil from this bankrupt company. For another piece, I tracked down a uh, rural landowner on whose land uh, sits an orphan well left behind by uh, W. Brett Wilson, uh, who you might know as the guy who tweets about uh, executing environmentalists and uh, talking about how Edmonton is uh, bringing in like forced 15-minute cities um, by uh, posting a map of Canterbury that is labeled clearly as Canterbury. It was nice uh, to take him down a peg. By the end of 2020, I uh, had moved to Calgary um, where I accepted a job covering City Hall at what the time was uh, at least a ostensibly a growing media outlet called The Sprawl. The editor-in-chief there had a bit of an existential crisis after a year and uh, laid us all off, um, which led me to create The Orchard, uh, my newsletter on Substack, where I pretty much write about whatever crosses my mind. Um, I do a lot of uh, media criticism, I would say, because there aren't a lot of people um, doing that in Canada, and uh, boy, is there ever a uh, need for it. Which leads me to the, the actual uh, topic of, of my uh, talk, um, the promises and pitfalls of uh, independent media. There is indeed uh, much promise in the uh, burgeoning, progressive, online, independent media sphere in Canada, which uh, I think really uh, took off during the pandemic. You've got outlets now like The Breach and The Maple that are relatively new, and then more long-standing uh, independent outfits like The Narwhal, The Taiyi, Press Progress, Ricochet, um, that are dedicated to telling stories and from a, a sort of unapologetically progressive uh, angle, for lack of a better term. I, I don't know if the narwhal would necessarily uh, identify with that. You know, sort of rejecting this like cult of objectivity, neutrality. Also doing uh, serious investigative reporting uh, in that process. These outlets are reader funded. They are uh, beholden to their readership rather than advertisers and other powerful interests like a, say, New Jersey-based hedge fund uh, in the case of Post Media. By not having like a nightly newscast or daily newspaper that you need to like fill space for. They're much better able to like take their time on, on their reporting and, and dive deep, which I mean you see sometimes in uh, you know big news outlets like The Star and you know even the Edmonton Journal or, or uh, Globe and Mail, but at, you know again as, as pressures increase on newsrooms uh, that's becoming harder and harder. Uh, to see um, that often this burgeoning independent media sphere provides a good counter to this uh, situation you have at legacy media outlets where reporters have their opinions just beaten out of them. You have to just say what other people are saying and, and not have any sort of uh, uh, slant or uh, like inclination based on your own personal views, sympathies, while at the same time 
you look at the opinion pages of every mainstream Canadian media, and they have, I mean, they have every flavor of conservative, mostly not much else. You'll read like the Globe and Mail or something, and, and you know, you read the reporting, and often you learn something, um, and then you turn to the opinion page, and it's just like, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> right? Like the range of opinions that you're allowed to have based on the news that's reported to you is like so, so narrow and uh, increasingly so. For those on Substack, and I'll talk shortly about the, the, the flaws um, of that particular platform, there's this freedom that I've found to write whatever you want without needing to get editorial approval from somebody else. But I would say many writers on that platform uh, could use uh, more than a little editorial oversight. For me, the benefit has really been chiefly uh, this ability to write stories that you wouldn't find uh, in mainstream news outlets, or at least wouldn't find them with regularity in uh, mainstream news. The ability to do so with and sort of develop my own voice with a sort of blend of opinion and analysis and, you know, I, I, a bit of old school reporting, if you will, you know, talking to experts and uh, get, getting my hands on documents, all that. You know, a really good example of that recently has been, of course, uh, the topic of Palestine, which I think is microcosmic of the broader issue of these narrow confines of debate. Uh, within mainstream Canadian media, you know, every op-ed columnist seemingly has either been silent about um, Israeli abuses in Gaza or been enthusiastically uh, cheering them on with the notable uh, and honorable exception of Sri Pardkar at the uh, Toronto Star. I've tried to get responses in these major news outlets published about some a couple of these like really awful, unfactual um, op-eds, to no avail. I don't even have editors return my emails. And that's an issue that isn't just confined to Palestine. So a lot of these pieces I want to write, I just put them on Substack, and the uh, reception has been pretty great uh, for the most part. Um, if you have something you know is good, are having difficulty uh, finding uh, somewhere to publish it, you can publish it on your own, which is undeniably liberating. You also get to build a personal relationship with your audience. I'm not a fan of uh, putting content behind a paywall because I want as many people to read it and engage with it as possible, but there are like perks uh, you know i offer to paid subscribers like regular uh ama videos right ask me any question and i do a short video answering like one question at a time it creates this parasocial relationship with your audience that isn't of course confined to newsletters i also co-host a couple podcasts which are both on the harbinger media network of sort of uh progressive uh, Canadian podcasts um, where you sort of build a sense of community with your listeners, but also with other like like-minded, uh, I really hate this term, but content creators. And I'm sure that's the case as well on YouTube and Twitch and the sort of video uh, platforms. Uh, I remember when I was living in Medicine Hat, still relatively new to Alberta, like when I moved there, I discovered this this then new podcast called uh, Alberta Advantage. Uh, people listen to that here? Yes. Yeah. I was like, finally, like I found people who actually get it, who actually um, look at political developments in this process, particularly as they pertain to the uh, hegemony of the oil and gas industry. You know, and then uh, when I moved to Calgary, I became uh, good friends with uh, all of them. So the sort of parasocial uh, relationships can often be, often transform into actual uh, friendships. I would also say that uh, having this sort of basic income, if you will, from my newsletter, as well as part-time work and freelance work, 
uh, allows me to pursue other projects like uh, my book that I'm going to plug right now, um, Kennyism, Jason Kenny's Pursuit of Power, which is coming out in February with Dundurn Press, the book publishing industry. You know, it doesn't pay really well uh, initially. My, my advance was very small, but having sort of some degree of income to fall back on uh, was certainly helpful in that. And if I had a full-time job, it wouldn't have been the easiest thing to take time off to like write a book. Sounds great, right? What's not to like? There are some notes of caution. I uh, think it's worthwhile to sound before uh, one jumps into a wholehearted embrace of uh, independent media. For starters, uh, my ability to focus on other projects is a product of uh, precarity that is reflected in this sort of larger gigification of the entire um, economy, which uh, Jason here, uh, Jason Foster, uh, recently wrote a very good book on that I would uh, urge you to check out and uh, talk to him about if you want to learn more about this moment of increasing precarity that we're living in. And that's not to say that there aren't stay jobs with good pays and benefits in uh, Per, you know, independent media, like at the Narwhal, um, they uh, have uh, full-time staff uh, in the Thai uh, as well, is another example, who, uh, you know, seem to be uh, paid quite well and treated very well and deservingly. It is when you're dealing with these uh, new media outlets, there is a certain uh, sense of insecurity, I think, at least, at the outset. These problems, I, I think I wanted to hammer home the point, aren't faults per se of independent media, the product of larger issues. And the market isn't going to solve them on its own. right? So it's great that there are independent media outlets that do um, offer uh, decent pay and benefits, but there are a lot that don't it, where, through fault of their own or not, and, and, and sort of, it's reflective of these bigger issues uh, in the economy writ large. Another issue I would say is that being beholden to your readers, I think, can often feel like being beholden to advertisers when you lose subscribers because you publish something they don't like. Um, I haven't really experienced that at this point, because I think that, that that is part of building this relationship with your audience, where even if they don't agree with you, they like respect your analysis, but that is like a possibility, right? A huge thing also is really the, the, people, the, the people who've mastered sort of independent online media are the far right. You know, outlets like The Rebel and True North and a bunch that I'm not gonna bother naming are, have, uh, really succeeded in, in, in generating outrage for clicks. Um, and that often has the effect of pushing the mainstream discussion and rightwards and influencing it in that way. And these are all, of course, the premiers like go to news outlets. Uh, there isn't really uh, an, an easy solution to the sort of uh, far right's uh, dominance of the uh, sort of online independent media landscape because they have access to resources that progressives or that people who are more left-leaning or centrist uh, don't necessarily have access to, right? There are always wealthy people who are going to pour money into uh, these causes that get people angry about anything but what they should actually be angry about. There's a lot less money in you know, more progressive circles, I think, by nature, um, because you know, prog social movements aren't about making money, right? They're about doing what's right. And as a result, that doesn't, uh, there's not as much money uh, in that. There's also this risk of audience capture, uh, whereby uh, in sort of uh, pursuit of generating clicks and you getting a sense of what you know your audience likes to see, you're not making your own editorial decisions anymore. You're allowing yourself to become a slave to the algorithm. 
which is another issue, this dependence on social media, which Bill C-18, federal legislation trying to um, push uh, these tech giants to subsidize uh, uh, journalism in Canada via this consortium of like legacy media players that has resulted in Meta refusing to allow uh, Canadian news. I'm uh, in tr Substack's not affected by that, um, so I'm fortunate in that regard. Um, and also, Twitter has been like a major source of uh, growing my audience, even since back in my medicine hat news day. Twitter, as or X, I guess as it's called now, isn't exactly the most uh, hospitable uh, place these days, and it is very much a reflection, I think, of how there is a lot of money in the far right and how um, they're able to dominate a uh, public discussion while sort of wrapping their ideology up in something that's edgy or subversive. And I allude to the issue uh, earlier of uh, sort of this lack of editorial oversight in newsletters. And that was uh, something that I was really, made me really reluctant about when starting my own newsletter, um, you know, I would get friends of mine to edit it periodically. People are busy, they have their own jobs. I can't pay an editor, so it's often just like a proofread. So now I just sort of uh, copy and paste into a Google Doc and like spell check it and read it through to make sure everything flows, which is why I'm like very grateful for the uh, rigorous editorial oversight I get. Uh, when I do write for independent media outlets that aren't just my soapbox, like The Breach or Ricochet, Jacobin, The Progress Report, The Tai. There is this, a, an issue of uh, independent media in general and newsletters in particular. There's a risk of, of them replicating the worst aspects of mainstream media. Like if you look at the top Canadian substacks, it's like a bunch of conservative MPs uh, the line, which uh, from what I gather is like the National Post opinion page, but with swear words. Paul Wells, who I think is worth reading, but um, certainly doesn't need more money. So established voices already have a leg up when uh, starting out a newsletter or even an independent media uh, website or nominally independent media website like, uh, you know, Ezra Levant. For example, he found the rebel. I mean, he's a creature of the mainstream media, has long been very successful at sort of gaming it. Uh, also, True North, Candace Malcolm was like a, uh, she was, I mean, she was a Jason Kenney staffer. While they present themselves as being anti establishment, they have, are, of course, creatures of uh, this very uh, establishment. But the perils I've outlined are deep seated issues with media in general. They're not going to be resolved by the growth of uh, progressive and independent media uh, on its own. In turn, these issues are the product of much larger social and political forces like growing income inequality, uh, precarious labor, the rise of far right, the far right, uh, opaque social media algorithms that aren't going to be solved uh, through media alone, but media does have an important role to play in uh, critically covering these, these very issues that I uh, just described. But it is great to see uh, media outlets springing up that are dedicated to offering uh, perspectives that you seldom see in mainstream news that are able to sort of take a step back and, and, and look at the bigger picture. So I will end by saying that if you value independent media um, and the work they do, there's only so much you can do as an individual. But uh, if you have money kicking around, support your favorite independent media outlet, like the Narwhal, uh, like my newsletter on uh, Substack or other uh, writers uh, whose work you appreciate. Um, I think that's a small thing people can do if they have the means to do so to uh, support um, independent media because it needs it. Anyways, uh, thank you.
I think everything I've ever heard about people who are more right-leaning is they tend to think black and white and that the complexities of things don't connect. So I, I'm just kind of curious if, if it's just that you, you have just decided that the progressives are your market or you think that there's a way of resonating and bringing some complexity in a meaningful way to people who tend to be black and white thinkers? That was just one of my thoughts when you were talking about that. Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting point. I, like if I could just speak about my coal miner piece again, I would say I expected a lot of those coal miners to be really mad with the piece that I put out because I said that coal causes a lot of problems and is a low-hanging fruit in the fight against climate change and those sorts of things. I think they saw themselves reflected in the piece that I wrote. I thought I think they saw themselves reflected accurately and they saw their views like taken seriously and other views also presented. I think that that idea that like people on the other side are more simplistic or they are just have less capabilities than we do. I, I would kind of push back on that and just say I think like complexity is something that we can all engage with. Like people really far on the left might also not want to see complexity, you know, like it, it's very an individual way of being, but I guess I'm hopeful and bright-eyed and bushy-tailed enough to just want to keep forging ahead with it. I just to say to jump off something that Jeremy said that there's like this feeling of being beholden to our readers to do the things that they want us to do. At the Narwhal, we feel like we have the privilege where we can write stories that we think are important, even if they are not going to somehow make us the most money or get us the most readers. And then so there are other kinds of impact that we also try to track. And yeah, so doing something complex might be long, might not be something everybody wants to see, but we do it anyways. I would like to know your reaction to the invitation of having Tucker Carlson come to Alberta. Oh. <laughs> That's yours. <laughs> I mean, is there anything more on brand um, for our premier? I actually wrote a piece for Jacobin not long after Smith won the UCP leadership race that and, and you know what I like about writing for Jacobin is it's an American publication and I get to like explain Canadian and particularly Albertan things to Americans. And I, I was like, yeah, it's kind of like if Tucker Carlson uh, ran uh, for, for president in, 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 or, or like a governorship and won. I think they're on the same page uh, on a lot of things. I mean, not necessarily everything. They're certainly both uh, incredibly gifted uh, communicators. They're just asking questions. Why does the woke left try to uh, silence us for asking these really important questions like declining white birth rates or, or, or whatever? Am I going to tune into it to cover for the newsletter? Um, Maybe. I, I think it would be interesting to, because it's also one of those things with like Smith and Carlson is like, oh, you don't want to give these people a platform, but they have a platform. So with that in mind, it's like, do you ignore it or do you do your best to critique it and, and, and uh, sort of break down uh, what they're saying? I've actually, on the topic of Smith, I've considered the possibility of doing like a Daniel Dale style, like fact check of uh, all of uh, sort of Smith's public appearances. I don't think anyone has the amount of time uh, in the world to fact check Danielle Smith. I'm not surprised that, you know, she's hosting Tucker Carlson. I mean, I think they're uh, very uh, like-minded on many issues. You mentioned something about in mainstream media, uh, reporters get the truth pounded out of them, uh, get the opinions pounded out of them. Do they get the truth pounded out of them? The reason I ask is because I, I, I follow climate change stories in the Edmonton Journal quite closely, and uh, I, I monitor them, and even just recently in Friday's paper, uh, a story about the cost to Wood Buffalo of the recent wildfires in that area. And not one mention of the climate change connection. Uh, do they do it out of ignorance or do they do it because that's what the Post wants of them? I think in most cases it's you know what your bosses are looking for and you know the types of things that are just going to get edited out of your story regardless and so you develop a habit, whether consciously or subconsciously, of uh, not doing those things. A lot of reporting that you read in the mainstream uh, news, 
you read between the lines and you, you learn something. But yeah, I mean, you have to think critically, like what's not here, what context is missing. And that's often not the fault of reporters because there are these immense pressures on them to do more work with less resources. And so I try when I'm like criticizing media to, to go easy on, 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 on reporters, especially names that I haven't heard before who are like maybe new to it. And because I've, I've made some dumbass mistakes in my time in, 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 in you know, news. Uh, so I, I am empathetic to that. But also to be ruthless with these pundits um, who go on TV and establish the sort of range of opinion that you're permitted to have, which ranges from like center right to far right uh, for the most part. So I did some research. Edmonton Journal is owned by Post Media Network and which is owned by China Asset Group Management, that's a hedge fund company for media specifically. So my question for both of you is, um, based on your expertise, like how do you think the demographic of the media would shift in the future, and how do we people in the audience would help to boost that change? Thank you. Like I said in my presentation, I think the old way of doing journalism is just not working for a lot of reasons anymore. And one of them is that publishers are beholden to forces that aren't necessarily looking for journalism as the utmost goal. Uh, they're looking to make profits. Jeremy outlined a lot of the perils of independent media. Um, I think there are a lot of challenges out there. I think it's terrifying to me that to think that we could all just have our own little media outlet that we go to to get information spit back at us that we agree with um, and that there's no sort of like central place where we can go to debate ideas. I do think that journalists across Canada are like the journalists themselves are really committed to journalism and really committed to pushing their editors and their bosses for positive change. I think you can see this um, in, for example, the Canadian Association of Journalists starting to track diversity of journalists and editors across the country. I think just having those sorts of statistics help us to point to the problems, recognize that they exist, and then we can start to change them. I would just point out that sort of the impact of like uh, this American hedge fund uh, owning post media is that their job is to uh, reduce debt, right? It, leverage debt and make money that way. It's not. It's not to produce journalism. Like they could care less. Ownership structures, they do absolutely play a role in in what can be said and what can't be said. And anyone who ridicules that notion, as many people do, who are often part of this problem, are, are lying to you. Like there, there is whether it's said or unsaid. It does reflect the range of discourse on public issues. In addition to supporting like independent media that is more critical and not just like chasing clout and, and just giving hot takes to uh, get clicks, though, you know, some may accuse me of that. I think having a strong public broadcaster would also uh, help. We don't have time for all, all the criticisms I have of the CBC, but th th there are many. In principle, having a strong public broadcaster, one that doesn't depend at all on advertising and is, is, is independent and can, has the resources to do in-depth journalism and offer a, a diverse range of perspective um, is incredibly important now. And, yeah. But unfortunately, we uh, seem to be moving in the opposite direction. Um, so that, that is concerning. Sharon pointed out in her presentation at a certain point, there's like a news avoidance that maybe 70% avoid the news at least some of the time. And I kind of wondered uh, about what the implications of that would be when it comes to independent media. I'm going to take a wild guess and say that most of the avoidance is probably, I don't want to hear all the bad news or the depressing news, et cetera. Independent media probably doesn't want you to, you know, you probably want people to, to read all your stuff, I'm going to guess. So does that influence, like, I'm going to report something better or a better lens to engage in the story? So news avoidance seems seems worrisome, even if you can understand the rationale. But you got got to have people paying attention and 
being aware of what's going on day to day, right? I think people avoid the news, like you said, because they don't want to hear the bad things that are happening in the world. There's a fatigue with hearing just isolated bits of new bad information. And I, so I do think there's an appetite for context. And I think there's an appetite for like, what does this, this thing happened? It's terrible. What does it mean? Like, how do we situate this in the broader context of the world and history? I think that's where complexity matters. I think that's where, for the narwhal, we do cover breaking news sometimes, but we often wait and add context and like get more of the picture. And I think that people come to us, even if they might be avoiding the daily news, because they want to know what this all means. It doesn't mean it has to mean, like, actually, it's fine. We found a puffy way to present this. I think it just means that you feel more, like you have a more comprehensive idea of what happened. It's a bit slower, slower journalism, I guess, a lot of the time. Or, and I would just add the plug for reporters who cover a beat, as, say, for example, when Mike colleague Drew Anderson, uh, he reports on Alberta and Saskatchewan, he covers energy and the environment. When breaking news happens, he has so much context just at his fingertips because that's all he does all day, every day. He's not covering tons of beats. He's not scrambling all the time to know what's going on all the way across the world. He's just covering that here. And so I think local beat reporters are super important and I think they can help. I think that this, this sort of culture we live in of breaking news and hot takes, clicks and all that, it does create this sense of complacency, I think, that overwhelms people. And that's why I think it is important for um, there to be outlets that take a deep dive and actually explain things to you in, in, in a way that's detailed, but also breaks it down for you, makes it easier to understand. Like I find the whole like explainers uh, format uh, grading, but there is, I think, uh, a, a sense of empowerment in, in, in actually understanding things with all their complexities and nuances, even though I think a lot of things are presented to us as complicated are uh, not that complicated, but everything has uh, a lot of moving parts to it, right? And, and, and I think the job of media is to break those down so it's like easy to understand. I do think that there's power in that, rather than as opposed to just being inundated with, you know, rewritten press releases, breaking news, tweets, ex posts.